We are very, very honored to be joined by the one and only Josh Feldman. He is a Melbourne, Australia-based writer. He writes a lot about Jewish topics, Israel-related topics. Uh, good morning to us in America, Josh. Good, very late night to you uh, in Australia. Hello, Rabbi. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So let's first uh, get a picture of, uh, since we're touring the Jewish world here, what is uh, Jewish life in Australia like now? Uh, in what ways is it different than Jewish life in, say, uh, the UK or in the United States? And how are things look, looking going to the future? Are young people staying in the community? Are they looking elsewhere? Uh, just uh, give us a bit of a picture of uh, what it's like to be Jewish in Australia these days. So the first thing is that it really depends on where you live. Australia has around 25 million people and we have... Our two biggest cities are Melbourne and Sydney. Between those two cities, we have around 50,000 Jews each, give or take. And so they make up around 100,000 of the 110,000 Jews in Australia. So they're overwhelmingly the two biggest Jewish communities. And we have two very, we have a very small community in Perth, which is another capital city on the Western coast and, you know, Jews scattered elsewhere. So in terms of Melbourne and Sydney, which are roughly the same amount of Jews, they're actually very different communities. The Melbourne community is much more geographically connected, where we're much closer together. We live, a lot of us live more or less in the same area. So as a religious Jew myself and for a lot of other religious Jews, that makes it much easier to you know be part of a community. We have something like 20 kosher restaurants in Sydney. Wow. They have you know three, four, five kosher restaurants. So religious observance is much higher in Melbourne. I think that may be more than Manhattan, by the way. I'm starting to think uh, well, 20 I, kosher I, restaurants I, I, is a I, lot. I, I, no, I, I, it's I, I, not. It's not more, but it's still uh, it's, it's it's up there, pretty close. So uh, on, on on a religious level, you know, the Melbourne Jewish community is much more observant. Having said that, though, both communities are very very involved. Perth as well. We have very very high level, uh, a very high quality of Jewish education. We have private Jewish day schools. I'm not quite sure what it's like in the United States, but we have a very high number of jewish kids who are going to jewish day schools through k to the end of school even when they don't come from orthodox homes they are going to jewish yeah. schools. so oh. in melbourne for example there are maybe six seven eight jewish schools private jewish mm -hmm. schools a lot of them a few of them are haredi or chabad but there's three major schools that the overwhelming majority of kids are either you know traditional secular or even even reform so we have oh. a very high proportion as well in perth and in sydney of jewish kids going to jewish day schools even if they come from irreligious homes and and as, as someone who uh spends a lot of time on that issue of day schools how does that work in terms of funding do you have a situation mm -hmm. like it in america where it's a separation of church and state zero government funding partial uh is it similar to the uk so we do get some government funding. Um, it's not great. So, for example, the school that I graduated from, I can tell you that this year, if you're doing year 12, which is the final year of high school, if you're not on any subsidies, just for one kid, the parents will be paying around, I think, 40,000 Aussie dollars just for the one kid. For which the is year. how much American? Maybe around 25. Wow, well, okay, that's expensive. 20, yeah. 25, 30. So if you can picture yourself putting three kids through Jewish day school from K to 12 without any subsidies, that's costing a lot you of a money. Billion dollars. Yeah, it's a big problem in the community. There are some really, really well-intentioned and really good people who are working on it in the community and trying to find ways to make it more affordable mm -hmm. because there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years of the fact that it's simply not sustainable. And as much as the Australian Jewish community values sending kids to school and as many parents make crazy sacrifices to send their kids to Jewish mm -hmm. school, the fact is that at some point you're just going to see numbers dropping off because there's only so much that people are able mm -hmm. to sacrifice to give their kids a Jewish education. Well, look at that. Uh, you know, we're halfway around the world there and still, uh, we're all uh, struggling with the same questions, right? It's a difficult issue uh, in Canada, the United States. I think the only place where they really were able to mitigate it, besides for Israel, obviously, where uh, you have government funding, is in the UK, where they they did figure out a way to reduce costs. There's increased government funding for schools. 
And uh, it's definitely a crisis that uh, engulfs the Jewish community, whether you're in Australia or in the U.S. Absolutely. Absolutely. We could always use some more money in uh, going into our organizations. Uh, no, look, school, pri- uh, uh, school in my opinion, the issue is that uh, besides for the actual cost, I'll give you an example here. You want to send your kid to Satmer, uh, a Hasidic school, it's going to be $3,000. A year you want to send your kid to Maimonides, where it's going to be a school where the kid can get into every Ivy League school, etc. It's thirty thousand dollars. So a lot of the cost is making sure our schools are competitive. And so the question is, where do you put that balance? Meaning, if you want to be able to compete with the most preppy schools that will make sure your kid can get in a good university, which to many parents is a condition uh, before they would send the child to a Jewish day school. They also want to know that the kid can get into a good university. Uh, so that's the balance. You're balancing basically general Jewish education for all with also maximizing the ability of the kid to get a top quality education. That's very interesting. It's not, I wouldn't say it's totally different here, but we certainly don't have I wouldn't call it a university culture, but, you know, we, we don't have those storied famed Ivy League universities in Australia where, you know, parents are really worrying from, you know, when the kid's 10, 11, 12, 13 no, years no, old. No, 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 no. It's more like two, but yeah. <laughs> more two, more two. That's for Shalom from before they go into creche. Yeah. yeah so we, we, we don't quite have that culture here, but it, it's certainly a thing where there are some schools that you're still going to be paying a lot of money, but they're known to not have as great an education. But thank God the, the Jewish schools in Australia really, really are high quality. Mm-hmm. Wow, fascinating. And in terms of denominations, do is there the same division? Because I know America is very, very uh, highly uh, denominationalized, meaning uh, it's not just Orthodox, Reform, Conservative. It's egalitarian, egalitarian. I can't even list the different denominations. Uh, the UK and South Africa, more, uh, I guess, people belong to Orthodox synagogues, even when they're completely non-Orthodox. Uh, where does Australia fall in terms of uh, affiliations? So Australia is not too dissimilar from South Africa and the UK, as you mentioned, in the sense that even the Jews who don't go to shuls, they the shul that they don't go to is an Orthodox shul. Mm-hmm. The overwhelming majority of shuls in Australia are Orthodox. A lot of them are staffed by Chabad rabbis, and the the rabbis themselves will be Chabad, but the congregations, the congregants will actually just be or they will be you know traditional, secular, but the Rabbis Chabad. There is a very, very, very small reform, progressive Jewish community in Australia, nothing at all compared to what you have in the United States. And, you know, reconstructionist Judaism, that kind of stuff isn't really even the thing here that people talk about. So the overwhelming majority of Jews here, if you go outside of the Orthodox community, you know, traditional, secular, whatever you want to call them, even if they don't go to shul, they'll still they would still identify with an orthodox shul. Where they go on Yom Kippur Rosh Hashanah, still going to be an orthodox shul. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, in terms of uh, Australia's affiliation with Israel, I know we have here uh, there's APAC, there's J Street, there's even uh, anti-Zionist Jews uh, organizations like uh, If Not Now and others. Where does that, uh, how does that work in Australia in terms of the community's different positions on Israel? Is there a united organization that has everyone under the same umbrella, different approaches? What's the uh, situation in terms of Israel? So we do have what we jokingly call the alphabet soup of Jewish organizations here, the AJAC, the ZFA, the UIA, Mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth. We... I would say that the Jewish community here is much more united in its support for Israel than perhaps other communities around the world. A lot of people put that down to the fact that it's either Melbourne or Australia. Uh, I think it might be Australia has the highest capita, has the highest per capita population of Holocaust survivors in the uh, world outside of Israel. So, it's interesting because it's like that also with uh, Canada, uh, Toronto, many, many Holocaust survivors. And so, yeah, there's, there's really a unified voice on these issues often. Yeah, so I I didn't know that about Toronto. Um, so yeah, the the communities in Australia were really built by Holocaust survivors, and I think you know coming out of that, they really had a very strong understanding of why they needed to build a strong Jewish community. In terms of the different organizations, you know, J Street, 
and Jewish Voice of Peace, whether some people say it's Jewish organization or not, APAC, our organizations, I would say, are much closer to the center. We don't we don't have as public fights. I'd, I don't know if that's what you'd call what happens in the United States with the different, you know, lobbying organizations. Mm-hmm. One reason I'd say is that the Australian, Israel doesn't play the role in the Australian psyche than it does in the American psyche, where they, you know, they say that Israel occupies a continent on the in the American mind. Mm-hmm. People care about it here, but nowhere near to the same extent that they do as the United States. And as a result, the Jewish organizations here, you know, they don't, I guess they don't get drawn into those kinds of fights. But generally speaking, they're relatively close to the center. The community is much more unified in its support of Israel. We don't shy away from criticizing Israel, but you certainly don't see things anywhere near to the extent that you do in the United States in terms of explicitly anti-Zionist Jewish organizations. There are some that, you know, there are one or two that are run by about three and a half Jews in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether that's just because we're a much smaller community, there's only around 110,000 of us, I'm not sure. But I think... Over, I think overall, we do have a high tendency to support Israel than we do see in other communities around the world. For example, so there was a Gen 17 survey of the Jewish community, the Australian Jewish community, which was released in 2017, most comprehensive survey ever. It asked us, it asked respondents a question, do you identify as Zionist? It didn't define what Zionist was. It mm-hmm. asked the response, yeah. do you identify as Zionist? And seven out of 10 said yes. Wow. When it asked them the question of, do you personally feel a sense of responsibility to ensure that Israel continues to exist as a Jewish state? It was something 85, 88% of respondents wow. said yes. So that's the kind of connection that we have over here too as well. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, there was the, uh, unfortunately, tragically, the most, uh, I guess, uh, mentioned story in terms of the Jewish community in Australia and its relations with Israel uh, is the tragic story of uh, Malka Leifer, the uh, principal who abused her students, ran to Israel, and then there was a very long extradition battle. Uh, th- how did that impact uh, relations between the Jewish community and Israel? It, it was really hard. Well, it's been really hard because she was only found guilty maybe a month ago wow. um, of the charge. It's, 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 it's very recent. These, there's, you know, there's no two ways about it. The Israeli government, the way that they handled it was an absolute shunder. There's, there, there, there's no way that you can possibly defend it. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it really hurt the community here. You know, we, we are known and whenever Israeli politicians come out here, they, they recognize and they always make comment about how the Australian Jewish community is known to be exceptionally Zionist. And so to see someone, Malka Leifer, who hurt the community, well, in particular the girls in her community in such a horrible way, and to see the Israeli government looking after her, defending her, using, you know, Yaakov Litzman, using corrupt means to keep her over in Israel, it really, really, it really, really hurt a lot of people here. Did it have a long-term and lasting negative impact on the relationship? I don't know. I think it, it's hard to say. There are certainly people every here and there who say, I won't give money to Israel because of that. I'm not going to wow. Israel because of that. But on a whole, whether it, on a whole, whether it really hurt the relationship between the community, I don't know. I think it's cer- it certainly showed another side to Israel that a lot of Australian Jews don't see. You know, a lot of people like to romanticize Israel. It's a Jewish homeland, and it is. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's a miracle. It is. But there's also this really nasty side of it, which we don't always see. And I think that did awaken mm-hmm. a lot of people in the community to that. But just uh, sort of to to process that uh is it seen as more of a israel australia issue or is it more of a haredi secular divided meaning yair lapid was not defending malika leifer and so i wonder if it's seen more of a haredi secular chasm rather than a uh, israel australia one it's a good question i really think it just depends on who you ask if i ask my secular friend they'll talk about how they can't understand you know why Adas would do this and why Adas, mm-hmm. which is the, for those who don't know, is the name of the Haredi community here that Malka Leifer is from. They don't understand why Adas, you know, wouldn't respect the court or would tell people not to go to the police. Mm-hmm. If you speak to other people in the community, they'd be furious that people like Yaakov Litzman was, you know, trying to pressure psychologists into, you know, telling the court X, Y, and right. Z about Malka Leifer's um, mental, mental situation. So I think it really just depends on who you talk to and 
what mm -hmm. where they're coming from. Wow, but it's interesting. There are definitely those who see uh, the uh, th this uh, situation with Malka Leifer as a Israel versus diaspora type of uh, division. I, look, I can tell you as someone who uh, worked very hard during COVID when Israel was close to people to try and get people in that the story of Malka Leifer gave a huge pause and hurt a huge amount of Aliyah, meaning after that story, Israelis were much, much more reluctant to allow a free flow of diaspora Jews into Israel. And in that sense, it, it caused a lot of damage because the, there was, uh, it, to them, <laughs> it's it's kind of ironic, right? So everyone sort of wants to see the problem on the other side. Uh, but to them, this was a uh, Jewish diaspora issue of look who the Jewish diaspora sends us. Uh, when uh, chutzniks, when people from outside of Israel come mm -hmm. here, uh, they often are this type of people, and therefore we should be much more suspicious. Uh, so now they require many more criminal background checks for people who, uh, if someone wants to make aliyah, now it's not a big deal. But when government offices were closed during COVID, uh, you needed from America, I believe, an FBI uh, a criminal record letter, it, 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 the, the bureaucracy of going to Israel became much more difficult because of Malka Leifer. So in a way, it's an irony because to Israelis, this was a Jewish diaspora problem. That's really interesting. I, I never thought about it that way. I, I, I never knew that, that it became a bureaucratic problem for you guys as a result. Major, 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 because uh, they, they, put, they added more requirements. Uh, and uh, that's because th there have been already several cases of... Uh, people who have criminal backgrounds who flee and uh and yeah it, it's uh from their end they're like uh these are the people who are coming here it's not the ideological type of uh, person that we think it is which by the way is you know it always happens when something terrible like that takes place a lot of good people uh have their rep uh, have their sort of reputation tarnished, right? So there are many people from the diaspora coming to Israel. Most people are coming for ideological re reasons. They're good people. But the fact that you have criminals using Israel as a safe haven cost everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, can I can understand that viewpoint. I can understand it. I don't. Have you ever watched uh, the uh, Netflix special about Mayor Lansky? Very no, I haven't. So Mayor Lansky... Did, did uh, Israel reject his Aliyah application? Is that... Yes, the... yes. So it's interesting. I actually just met someone recently who knew him, an old Jew, and he he's still angry. He says, Shonda, they didn't let him in. Uh, Mayor Lansky was a uh, the accountant of what was called... Uh, I think it was called Murder Incorporated. Just the name kind of gives away what it was. So the, he was the accountant for the, the mob. Uh, and there were it's just a fascinating, by the way, uh, subject, uh, Jewish mobsters in the 30s. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of people, Bugsy Siegel. Uh, I actually worked in the shul that has a plaque for him to this day because that's where he, his family dubbed. So they dedicated a, you go in there, you'll see Binyamin Siegel uh, in the memorial plaques. But uh, Mayor Lansky, basically in, in 1948, when Israel was desperate for for weapons and arms, he uh, he made sure that a huge amount of money uh, was raised uh, when Golda Meir came, and he was very, very, very helpful. It was against the law to send weapons to Israel. Uh, and so you had to break the law if you wanted to send weapons to Israel, and he was involved in a lot of that. And then when the American government, uh, I don't remember which president it was, uh, decided that they uh, wanted him, and they, they wanted him uh, to, to stand uh, to, for justice, to you know, be in court, uh, they sent them, he, he fled to Israel and they sent a demand to extradite him. And uh, it, it was a direct request and Golda right away gave him in. And you can see the scene there. It's an amazing scene. Uh, he's livid and he's, you know, he's after everything I've done for Israel, all that. And now they throw me out like this. It ended up he got away with it in America. He stood trial and he got out. Uh, but uh, he felt betrayed, and and many Jews felt it was a betrayal too. But uh, you know, the idea that Israel should be a safe haven for someone who committed a crime is obviously not a, a good idea for anybody. No, although Ben Gurion, I don't know if he did say, it, but he's quoted as saying that when Israel has prostitutes and criminals speaking in Hebrew, then we'll know that it was a success. 
Right, but I, I don't know if they want the English speaking ones, but no, that's uh, true. That's true. He would have had to learn to speak Hebrew before being around. Yeah, but great. uh yeah, look, it's it's a it's a it's a great movie about Miralansky, but yeah, that sort of depicts the fact that there are many people who helped Israel and uh they didn't necessarily feel that, that those favors were reciprocated. Uh but uh look, it's it's a complicated question because obviously the implications that it has for Israel. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the topic that uh, everyone hates but loves to talk about, and that is uh, anti-Semitism in Australia. What, uh, have the levels been rising? Uh, where are things standing with that? They have been rising. Not to the extent elsewhere around the world, thank God. When it comes to, if you kind of break it down, I think one big, big, big difference is that we don't have guns here. We we have guns, but <laughs> you, don't really, you don't you don't really see them around. Um, at least if we if we compare it to the United States. So, snapshot: we used to have guns in Australia. Um, you you could you could get a gun if you wanted a gun, more or less. And then in the nineties, I'm not sure if it was possibly nineteen ninety seven. Some guy in his twenties, uh, went to Port Arthur, which is an old prison. It's now a tourist site in Tasmania, which is our southernmost state, and he just shot up. Um, a bunch of school kids who were on a school excursion there. And long story short, the prime minister said, all right, Australia, hand in your guns. The government's going to pay you and you're going to give us your guns. And the people said, okay. And there was a massive, massive, massive campaign and people just handed in their guns wholesale. Um, and so we haven't had a mass shooting since then. So why that's relevant is because obviously, unfortunately, though, we see it was just Robert Bowers who's been found guilty of the Pittsburgh Tree of Life massacre they're looking at the death sentence. So the far right here has been a big issue the last couple of years. They've, we've actually had two neo-Nazi protests outside Parliament's house in Melbourne in the last month or two. And why that's, you know, thank God that we don't have guns because as much as we know what those kinds of people want to do, they don't have access to weaponry to the same extent that, you know, play people in the United States and Europe do. So the far right's an issue here. It's an increasingly concerning issue, but we are lucky that it's not to the extent they don't have access to guns like in other countries. As for the far left, it, it's hard to tell, truth be told. Um, they've had a couple of big BDS victories lately, but they they don't seem like they're as organized and they just don't seem to have the support that they do in other countries. We don't have people like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and Jeremy Corbyn in parliament. There are, there are serious questions over whether Australia's current government is going to, rec federal government is going to recognize the state of Palestine. That's a very real possibility. Um, so that could for, that could invigorate anti-Semitism on the left. Um, but in terms of what you see on university campus, there are some Jewish, there are a lot of Jewish students who feel uncomfortable on campus. You do have the occasional anti-Israel motion that's passed by student unions, but it's much, much more power of compared to, other countries compared to the UK, compared to the United States, South America, South Africa. Wow, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because there's this debate here often about, oh, whose anti-Semitism is worse, the right or the left? And because Jews are so entrenched in, uh, you know, political positions and just in general, because America is such a political country, uh, there's, you know, oh, anti-Semitism on your side is worse, on your side it's worse. So first of all, I don't know why people can't just say it's bad on both sides. But uh, the issue of guns is a real big deal because even though you may find more explicit uh, anti-Israel rhetoric on the left, uh, nobody's walking into a synagogue with an AR-15 after their class in Berkeley uh, that mm -hmm. condemns Israel. So they can say any number of things in their college campus, but they're not the ones showing up in a synagogue with a gun. And uh, just as a rabbi myself, you know, you, you, you're as a rabbi, you're sitting at the front of the synagogue facing the door. And since the Pittsburgh shooting, you're looking and it's like, will a guy show up with a gun or what do you do if a guy shows up with a gun? Uh, and uh, in that sense, I think it's uh, to me the, the, the danger of uh, anti-Semitism, which is weaponized, is obviously so much more severe than uh, whatever ridiculous statements uh, Rashida Tlaib is making, because... You know that that's uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, just the 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 fight within the Jewish community about about anti-Semitism is is uh, kind of disheartening, and uh, it's great to hear that in Australia the community 
is more unified and uh, comes more together. And uh, it, um, yeah, just a question. I don't know if you watched the uh, Netflix uh, Jewish matchmaking special. Uh, if you did, I'm sure you uh, had a good time. But uh, how are things, because often what happens in uh, what we call smaller Jewish communities, even though Australia has well over 100,000 Jews, is that young Jews go to uh, other countries. I remember when I was in Yeshiva in New York, uh, we had someone from Australia just coming to date. Uh, how, how do things work in terms of young people seeing their future, dating, and uh, staying in Australia? So I, I should actually say I didn't watch Jewish matchmaking or I haven't watched it yet. When, when I first saw it come out, my first thought was, oh, my God, we do not need another Netflix show about Orthodox Jews. Right. Um, but I've, I've heard that it's somewhat genuine. Maybe I'll watch it. She's actually, what's it, it's her name? Eliza Ben Shalom, I think. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's yeah. She's out to Melbourne in a couple of months. Oh, she's wow. going to be the so that'll be quite interesting. Um, in terms of, in terms of, mat, well, in terms of, I guess, finding a partner in Australia, there's a joke that a lot that all the Sydney and Perth you people, young people who can't find a partner to make Aliyah to Melbourne or to Israel. Um, wow. Some also go to London or the United States. It really, again, does depend on, you know, what part of the community you're from. I'm I'm modern Orthodox. And so that really narrows down the pool for me. If you're, mm -hmm. you know, a traditional or a secular Jew, that makes life much easier in terms of finding someone else. Wow. Uh, but generally speaking, there are, unfor unfortunately, there are a lot of people from Perth who move over to Melbourne, partly because, you know, those communities are very small over there and they want to find someone, but also because they just want to live in a bigger community, not necessarily romantically um, or marriage focused. And as well mm -hmm. in Sydney, there's also a lot of, there's a fair few religious Jews who come down to Melbourne again, because the religious community is much smaller there. So on one hand, it's harder to be religious too, but also the dating pool is much smaller over there. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you go outside of, you know, the religious community, again, you've got some 50,000 Jews in Melbourne. Wow. You, you you should be able to find someone hopefully mm -hmm. and if not the jewish community is everywhere else all right uh, very interesting and uh, finally what are things that you wish the uh jews outside of australia knew about jewish life in australia is there something we're missing is there uh, uh i know you mentioned the 20 restaurants in melbourne which is definitely uh worth uh, noting but uh what are we missing and what would make a uh 20 hour flight is that it i think from the united states I think Melbourne to LA is 14 hours. Or so for New York, it would be, uh, yeah, it would be uh, close to a 20 hour journey. Uh, what would make that worth it? And uh, what do we not know about Jewish life in Australia that, uh, what are we missing out on? You, wow. you know, you know about all the craziness going on here, but I'm sure there's some good things going on there. And uh, what, what do we not know? I'm I'm going to give a disappointing answer. Life's just really simple over here for Jews. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna be disappointing, and maybe maybe that's a good thing. I'm I'm biased, but I'm a strong believer that outside of Israel, Melbourne is the best city in the world to be a Jew. I've lived yeah. here all my life, so I'm exceptionally biased. But mm -hmm. life's simple; it's easy. Most Jews, I'd be confident, say don't have to worry about anti and anti semitism on a daily basis. We don't mm -hmm. worry about you know whether or not a Nazi is going to come into our shore with an assault rifle on a Shabbos morning. Wow. Um, it's easy to be a Jew here. Simulation is an issue. Jewish education is an issue. But I think we have it really well, relatively well. And I think maybe simplicity can be a good thing. Um, as to what would make the 20 hour trip worth it. If you want to put yourself through that, um, if you can afford business class, do that. I can't, but <laughs> definitely try if you can. Um, what would make it worth it? It's a massive country. Um, it's a massive, massive country, and mm -hmm. it's just a really awesome, fun place. Aussies are super chilled. We're super relaxed. Wow. I was in, that is your uh, reputation. That is their reputation. I was in Israel in December, and I was talking to a bunch of Americans who were on possibly, I think there was some some, some post-school trip, maybe from San Francisco with their, with their temple. And the one of them was telling me, you know, I really love Australians because you know that you're better than everyone else, but you'll never admit it. Us Americans are really obnoxious. Uh -huh. Her words, not mine. Um, so just come over, visit. It's really far. It's really expensive to come over here. I don't know if it's worth the money, but if mm -hmm. you want to come, it's great. It's chilled, beautiful wow. sites. Um, uh, just yeah. one more question I'm thinking of is where does New Zealand fall in all this? Is there, because I, I know they're somewhat close to you, uh, uh, that side of the universe, but uh, is there 
large uh, interaction between Australia and, and New Zealand, uh, of the Jewish communities in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, just because of proximity, or maybe uh, Singapore, meaning are any of your neighboring countries, uh, Jewish communities, uh, keeping with you, you know, stronger contact? So there's a very small community in New Zealand, actually for all the youth women. So I don't know what you have in the, in the US, but you know, for Havonim, Draw, Benet, Kiva, Hashemar, Tsair, Netzer, that kind of stuff for all of their, we have what we call fed camps so federal camps at the end of each year in our summer mm -hmm. and New Zealanders will actually come over to Australia to join the camps. So there is actually that interaction relationship for kind of the teenagers early 20 years. Other than that, you know, unless you have some sort of formal position in the mm -hmm. community, there isn't much of an interaction. It, it is a very, very small community. I, I don't even know if they have any kosher restaurants there outside possibly wow. of what they have. Um, very small country, very small community. I've never been over there, but I do know that it's a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to come down to Australia, you should also visit New it's Zealand. It's, it's interesting. My great grandmother lived in Hong Kong. She was uh, oh, uh, one of the builders of the community there, and uh, they would import kosher meat from Australia. So even though I'm sure it's a long flight, when you're in an area that doesn't have much kosher food, etc., then sometimes uh, you look to neighbors beyond uh, you know one or two miles, but even more. Uh, all, right. all right, Josh Feldman, thank you so, so much for taking the time. Late at night for you, early in the morning, I guess not too early, but morning for us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you for all your writings and for everything you do. And um, if you're ever here in the uh, United States, then uh, give me a ring and it would be great to see you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thanks.